Hello and welcome to the YouTube podcast series of Dinis Guada, Cities ABC and Open Business Council. I'm Hilton Super, the Vice Chairman of Student Group, and I'm pleased to conduct this interview with Felix Drew, the CEO of ARPA and Bella Protocol, where we interview people who are changing the world, people that are inspiring us and the world with their achievements, creativity and acumen, with the use of technology. In previous interviews, Dennis Guada and I have interviewed more than 200 amazing people and achieved more than 10 million views of these interviews. These interview series is in partnership with our platforms, openbusinesscouncil.org, citiesabc.com, and fashionabc.org. All four IR-based platforms which employ the use of truth and trust through blockchain and the deployment of data analytics like AI and machine learning. Today, I'd like to introduce Felix Chu, CEO of ARPA and Bella Protocol. Felix is the co-founder and CEO. He graduated in finance information systems um, from New York University, which is, now, which is known very much for its science and AI research programs. And for the last six years, Felix has been working in venture capital investments in FinTech, big data and AI and startups. And most recently, he has led the blockchain sector research and early stage investment of the Fosun Group, one of the largest conglomerates, conglomerates in China. So welcome, Felix. Thanks so much, Hilton. It's, uh, it's my honor to be here and to share more on uh, you know, blockchain general, ARPA, and also Bella Protocol. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's get it started. Absolutely. So, t Felix, tell me a little bit more about yourself. You mentioned that you were born in Beijing, but what got you to where you are today in the U.S.? Sure. Uh, I was born and raised in Beijing. It's my hometown. Um, I went to I went to international high school, you know, to study um, A level, actually the uh, the British course during my high school, and then I went. I you know I, I took my SAT and TOEFL. I went to uh, school in the U.S. Uh, NYU, and uh, studied information systems and finance. So um, that's that's pretty much my background. I, I've always uh, I've always been curious about technology. You know, since I was a kid, um, always tried to get more new tech gadgets uh, from my parents. And at a school, uh, you know, like I, I also I've got to know many people who are like-minded people. And now we are actually. We have so like uh, my co-founders. Uh, we were actually knowing each other for quite some time. Uh, some of them actually I dated back to high school and college um, time. So uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been great since 2018 when when we first started ARPA. You know, four years seems to be a really long time for blockchain industry, uh, and I've seen you know good market, bad market. And now, you know, like a lot of people are very pessimistic about crypto and blockchain in general, but I would say, you know, it's just like a, a cycle, much like before. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much my background. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting that you were talking about that you set up ARPA with your friends, really, from your 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 early days in education back in in Beijing. So they obviously moved to New York. Um, at the same time as you did, is that correct? Um, actually, like I have, uh, I have uh, three other co-founders. Um, Ye Mu uh, is actually uh, he used to work at Fidelity and also a startup uh, in Chicago. Graduated from uh, University of Iowa, and also Bo Mo is our CTO. Uh, he's a college friend with Ye Mu, also graduated from uh, University of Iowa. He was uh, he was working at a hedge fund uh, systems company, you know, in Chicago before uh, they joined ARPA, and also Alex, uh, who's our chief cryptographer, chief scientist. Uh, he actually went to my same high school, and he, uh, and he is uh, two years senior than me, so graduated from uh, with a PhD in cryptography from Tsinghua University. Um, yeah, so uh, so it's uh, you know like we all share some personal. Uh, background and stories, and mm -hmm. it's really good that we collaborated. That we've been collaborating for the past four years since 2018. 
Oh, that's very interesting. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, obviously, you started, um, um, you know, the experience of what we know as the blockchain evolution, revolution, whatever you want to call it, where obviously the two mainstays in that obviously, obviously are the main chains of uh, Ethereum and, 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 uh, and Bitcoin. What was the motivation to really start looking at the layer two um, of what is known as um, in the blockchain world as, a, as, as a, a second layer that sits on top of the main chains? Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Um, so layer ones are blockchains such as uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, you know, Solana, Avalanche, um, you know, Cardano, etc. Right. So it has. So it's the it's the blockchain that we commonly talk about. And because like these blockchains have their their like performance limitations. For example, uh, Ethereum only offers about fifteen transaction per second or TPS. So it's very, so like when the time, when the time that uh, the market is very volatile or, you know, there are more and more decentralized applications running on top of Ethereum, um, the transactions get really crowded. And sometimes you need to wait for, you know, one minute or even more to wait for a transaction to be confirmed, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, layer two is a way that we can scale the performance, uh, scale the, uh, the transaction per second using some methods, for example, uh, using less nodes to reach consensus as a layer two in the layer two setting. And then you have a challenge period that, you know, like yeah, every time you broadcast on Ethereum layer one to make sure all the transaction is correct, right? So. So there's a challenge period that people can say, okay, now like the layer two nodes are incorrect, right? I want to show some proof and before, you know, it really broadcast on Ethereum layer one. So in that, in that way, you know, we can achieve higher transaction per second, or you can also use some um, cryptographic methods like uh, zero knowledge proofs, right? So it has more succinct way of confirming a transaction uh, and now it's, it's becoming more and more popular as a scaling or layer two solution. Um, so uh, just to sum it up, I feel like layer two is one, you know, is one layer on top of the blockchain and to make it more, to make it faster and cheaper. Mm -hmm. So in the, in the process of building the layer two, you, you, keep, you talk about um, what is called as multi-party computation. MPC. Um, can you explain that a little bit more to our audience? What that means? Sure. Yes. Um, is act, uh, we are actually not a layer two. Uh, for ARPA is a um, verifiable computation network. So you can think about layer two as a like a you know si very similar to blockchain, right? So the nodes are in charge of you know like doing the consensus within. Uh, their layer, the layer two, and then to broadcast transactions every period of time in, uh, onto layer ones like Ethereum. But for us, uh, we are different. So we are not layer two. Uh, we are not targeting to scale the transactions to, the, to scale the TPS for Ethereum, but rather we are a verifiable computation network that we run uh, a, cryptograph a cryptography algorithms called threshold BOS. Um, so uh, on the high level, like threshold BLS is to shard, um, you know, a private key when it's first generated, right? So uh, for example, you can shard your, the private key into 10, uh, 10 different parts, and then you can, you, can, uh, you can require at least like five parts together in order to sign a transaction to move the fund. So it can ac actually offer better security for the key uh, for the private key and it's commonly used. So this technology is commonly used in uh, key management systems. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes, you know, within cold storage for uh, exchanges, uh, for custodian uh, parties, et cetera. Uh, for us, for ARPA, we are building a permissionless uh, threshold BLS network. And there are several use cases, for example, verifiable random numbers that can be used by multiple chain uh, D apps, decentralized APPs, 
and also the consensus uh, node selection process. Mm -hmm. right. So like uh, you see like, you know, during lottery, you know, during games, uh, during NFT mintings, uh, during consensus, you always need to choose the winner, right? So it's kind of like a lottery process and yeah. you want it to be real, like to be really random and verifiable of that randomness to ensure the transparency and the fairness. Um, so that's where, you know, ARPA kicks in, uh, you know, we can, you know, our random, our verifiable random numbers can be plugged into multiple blockchains. Okay. So how do you generate those variable random numbers? Where is that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, like these random numbers are generated within the ARPA computation network, you know, with at, at least 20 nodes together running uh, the threshold signature scheme BLS algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, uh, it's a it's a way that it's a cryptographic algorithms meaning all the process uh, is can be verified uh, with uh, primitives. Mm -hmm. So um, so in that way, you know, it's much more uh, reliable and it's much more transparent versus a hash function or some traditional ways that people can generate ran, uh, pseudo random numbers on chain. Okay, so those random numbers are, are effectively done off chain. Okay, I can understand. Yes. And the way you generate those. And, and therefore, um, in terms of the, how do you maintain the correctness of that computation in terms of verifying any, any other sort of called malicious conditions? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you solve that problem? Sure. Yeah, we, we, we have our own security assumptions. Um, and then like there's, yeah, there has to be, so basically like when um, during the distributed key generation process, you know, we mm -hmm. need a set of nodes to generate that private key, right? And then during the transaction signing, you know, we at least to use part of that group who, gener who generated the key shards. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so that's how, you know, we can protect the, uh, the security uh, protect the verifi verifiability for the random numbers. Uh, the security assumptions, uh, you know, right now is, uh, you know, it can still be, you know, can, can be customized by, uh, by the users, right? Depending on how, what level of security they want. Thank you for that. So once you, once you, 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 you wrote your white paper, you developed the protocol, you developed uh, the, 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 the ARPA, um, platform. Um, how long has it been running for? Mm -hmm. uh, at first, we actually pursued uh, general purpose multi-party computation. Uh, mm -hmm. we, use, uh, we are actually uh, productizing uh, an algorithm called Scale Memba, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, more general purpose. Uh, instead of uh, threshold signature scheme, BLS is more specific, right? So, but then like, uh, you know, that was in 2018, 2019 that we, uh, we were pursuing uh, general purpose multi-party computation, but we found out that uh, there's limited on-chain use cases, right? So uh, people are not using block, so far people are not using blockchain for like private data analytics, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like uh, private set uh, intersections. So a lot of these functions that we offer uh, is actually not that popular on chain, right? So that's how, that's why like last year, you know, we, we start to uh, dive more, dive deeper into threshold signature scheme, um, which has more use cases for, you know, like uh, for decentral, decentralized custodian, for verifiable random number generations, uh, you know, for cross chain bridges, et cetera. So we think that the infrastructure that we are building right now a special BOS network uh, should be more permissionless, uh, more and also offers more use cases. For the, so for the sake of our audience, uh, you use a few things here. You use POS. You, I assume you're using proof of stake. Could you explain to our audience what the difference is between proof of stake and proof of work? Sure. Yeah, proof of stake is uh, if you hold some tokens and then you stake your tokens as a, uh, you know in the validator then you have like a chance, you know, to 
to basically uh, uh, being rewarded with, uh, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with more, with some more tokens. So, mm -hmm. so it's like, uh, it's like savings, basically, yep. right? So you save your money, you get some interest. Uh, and that interest is paid out by, you know, transaction fees um, and also by, you know, like no, node selection uh, rewards, right? So, you know, it's, uh, it's usually like two, two revenue source for the stakers. And for proof of work, you know, Bitcoin is using proof of, proof of work. So essentially you need, uh, you need to buy like the, mi the mining machines, like the mining machines to do the hash functions, and then you know to uh, you know to provide hash power for the network in order to get a chance uh, for the block reward. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. I'm glad you explained it so so succinctly <laughs> to our to our audience. Um, I mean, one of the things that you've started mentioning in terms of how you're developing the protocol, and we'll talk about Bella in, in a second. But before we go there, I want to talk a little about decentralized finance called DeFi, um, and that is, uh, you know, where the majority of all these type of protocols are moving towards and building ecosystems around that. Could you explain what is DeFi? Sure. DeFi is, um, it's similar, yeah, like, uh, you know, decentralized finance, right? It's still finance. Um, so basically, like, the business model is very similar to traditional financial institutions, um, however, you know, it's, uh, it's operating on, because it's operating on Ethereum or other blockchains, uh, all the transactions are transparent and also because it's uh, the logic, the business logic is written in the smart contract. So everything is uh, open, right? It's open source. Um, also, like it's, uh, you know, uh, you can you basically, you know, if you think of a machine, like an engine, um, Traditional finance is like an engine with a box within a box, right? You cannot see what's going on inside a box. You know, if there's anything broken, uh, you never know, right? It's a black box. However, like for DeFi, it's like the engine is in a transparent box. Um, it's also not, um, there's also no human control. Like ideally, there's no human control of these smart contract code. Mm -hmm. So that it's a transparent box and the engine is there, you know, built to last. Um, people cannot change it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the main difference. And, and the, you know, there are, there are benefits about you know, using DeFi because, first of all, you can see everything, right? So you can, you know, you know what's going on in that black box. Uh, you know, if anyone's uh, cheating, right? If anyone's kind of taking money from the bank, uh, you know, as a, Mm -hmm. as an insider uh, and also you, you you are assured that uh, the smart contract itself cannot be manipulated by someone or some parties um, you know so it offers better uh, transparency it also offers better reliability yeah I mean, this is a bit of a philosophical um, uh, question and you talk about transparency you talk about um, People can see exactly who's doing what transactions and when. Why is it, in your opinion, that the, the current financial community, the regulators and things like that, the regulators and the banks are very, very frightened of DeFi, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. um, I would say like DeFi is still too small a market for them to be frightened. Uh, right now, DeFi, like all the total, um, you know, like total asset locked in the smart contract, uh, I think it's like uh, 80 billion, I think it's $80 billion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. So, and also because like the recent uh, downtrend, um, like this number is still shrinking. So $80 mm -hmm. billion is uh, a very small number uh, compared to traditional finance, trillions of trillions of money. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we are still on the early days. Mm -hmm. um, however, yes. So like you said, you know, it's philosophical, uh, it has some philosophical value that, uh, there's, uh, it offers, uh, unparalleled transparency versus a traditional finance, financial mm -hmm. institutions, 
uh, as we've seen like down the history that um, you know people kind of like took more to the risk that they are not willing to take uh, because of their own interest in the bank uh, and then you know the, the bank can go under right so during the financial crisis uh, we've seen this a lot um, however for DeFi you know it's much harder for people to manipulate much harder for people to take money from it um, and uh, you, you like even though you can see all the transactions you know and there are people who are working on privacy right to protect the transactions however like the core is still a smart contract that nobody can alter mm -hmm. uh, I think that's yeah, that that's pretty much like that's why you know I think DeFi will at least take a certain market share from traditional finance down the long run. I mean, would that be for like we 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 as you and I know you New York? I've worked in London in hedge funds, etc. I, you know, that mainstream traditional financing mechanism. You know that that will take a long time to unwind itself and become much more um, decentralized and have the level of transparency of DeFi. But there are um, parts of the economy and people who would be able to benefit very quickly from DeFi um, because they are essentially underbanked. They are in countries that aren't traditionally served by the banking and finance community. Do you feel that DeFi has that, will, will accelerate the adoption of DeFi um, products um, in, in these type of markets rather than mainstream? Mm, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a very popular uh, view that DeFi can benefit the unbanked. Um, personally, I'm not a big fan of that thesis uh, because you know look at how many users are there for DeFi. you know after two years we still only have about a million of uh, one million of active users of DeFi. so mm -hmm. if you add the monthly average uh, active users for uniswap you know, for compound for ave all these like big DeFi protocols you can see that very small numbers of people provided most of the liquidity so yeah. I, I would say like for the DeFi market, you know, right now it, you know, it has the potential because of the transparency, because of the, uh, you know, like the, uh, some mechanisms uh, that's superior versus traditional finance. Um, it can be like a, like a base layer for finance in the future, right? Yeah. So even though you have small numbers of players, but they can provide large liquidity and they're willing, mm -hmm. you know, they are more comfortable to put their to park their money into DeFi versus another crypto bank or another financial institutions. Um, however, for the M band, first of all, you know if you convert if you want to convert them into crypto users, first of all you need better on ramp and off ramp from fiat, right? Better AMLs and also better user experience for crypto wallets. And you need to offer lower fees, right? Because right now, if you interact with any DeFi protocol on Ethereum, it costs you at least ten dollars for each transaction, at least. So uh, there's no way for the M banks to spend that money, you know, to use DeFi. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a reality. But I say, you know, like the, the industry is still developing very fast. You know, there are many scaling uh, solutions coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, gas fees can be lower on different blockchains. Uh, user experience is something that you know a lot of the talented teams are working on. So maybe in f in the next five years we can see uh, more user adoptions and finally kind of going to the end banks, uh, to the end band. But I just don't see uh, the thesis to be realized right now. So it will take time. At the end of the day, purely because of the transparency and the low cost you could start getting mass adoption much later down the line, particularly when there is high um, use case for the underbanked, which is, you know, or smaller SMEs, et cetera, who have no access to trade finance, for example, you know, to really, really accelerate um, their businesses using these digital tools. Yes. Um, 
because there are many limitations uh, on chain. For example, you have limited amount of personal data that you can assess the risk, right? So one, um, I would say like in the, in the traditional finance world, um, um, there's like, you can get credit loans because you know, they have a well around data on a person or on a company. Mm -hmm. However, on chain, you know, every, all the, all the addresses are more or less, uh, uh, you know, like, um, anonymous and you only have their kind of the, the, the Ethereum or other chain account data, right? So you can see what, what they have in their wallets. Mm -hmm. However, like, so that's why the only thing that you can do is collateralized loans, right? So if you have $1 worth of Bitcoin you can take out, you know, 30 cents of, uh, stable coins. So that's the only thing that we can do as DeFi protocol. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think this can be changed, you know, in, in the near future. Uh, I think, uh, I think down the road, there are going to be more like big data, uh, big, big data companies that kind of um, um, supply, you know, the personal data, but it's also a little against, it's a little against the uh, ideology of blockchain that everyone should have their, you know, like, uh, they uh, should be able to stay kind of out of the grid uh, to be anonymous. Yeah, I understand. This is what we've been at here at Open Business Council and um, on our platforms working very hard on, to focusing on how do we get that digital identity um, to and structure that digital identity for in corporates and individuals in such a way that you can enter the DeFi space and therefore and be able to shake hands with other digital identities um, regardless of where they've been issued and that's something that we've been working on um, with one of our partners um, mastercard so i understand that space very well that bridging that gap between the pure theoretical digital anonymous but truth and trust world into the real world mm -hmm. that's where the, that's where we want to bridge the gap Yes, yes. I understand. But it's so moving on from, uh, you've, thank you very much for defining what DeFi is and the use, you know, the sort of use cases and the challenges that there are in the DeFi space at this present moment. Now, what did this motivate you to start the Bella Protocol? Yeah, like we, uh, so like I, um, I've been always kind of early, uh, you know, into different applications personally, like, you know, because of my curiosity, I, you know, I tend to uh, look into things when it first come out. Mm -hmm. right? so I was an early user of MakerDAO back in 2019, uh, Synthetics when they first launched, when first launched uh, and also some other DeFi protocols, um, you know, during 2019. So I, 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 you know, I had a, I had a gut feeling that uh, this can be a real killer, you know, application for, for, uh, for blockchain because, you know, finance is something that people need the most trust uh, during the traditional, uh, you know, within the traditional financial world. However, right, blockchain offers unparalleled transparency, you know, um, and also, uh, so, so in that way, you know, it can solve a lot of trust issues. Right. So you save your money into a bank because of the brand name, right? Because it's been existing for the past 100, 200 years. So it's trustworthy. However, if like we put these things on chain, uh, you don't need to trust anyone. You know, you just look at a code or at least look at a code review and to see if it's really like unaltered, uh, unable to be altered by a single individual, right? So uh, if the business logic is uh, sound, um, and everything is kind of insured by the blockchain itself. So in that sense, you know, back in uh, late 2019, I was thinking about, um, you know, like how to gain more yield, you know, using DeFi. And in early, I remember correctly, and in February 2020, you know, we start to incubate Bella protocol within our core team uh, we hired more engineers, um, you know, like, from, uh, and then we, uh, you know, we, uh, we start build out uh, Bella Protocol. 
Uh, we also pivoted a little bit because, you know, back in 2020, early 2020, we wanted to build uh, like a, a lending platform similar to uh, Compound and Aave. Um, but soon, like uh, in, I remember in June 2020, uh, Compound launched their uh, token, Comp, and their TVL just grew from $100 million to $600 million and soon like went up to a billion dollars. Uh, so there's like very, uh, very little chance for us to continue pursue the lending platform. Uh, but I also see, you know, but I'll also see uh, the opportunity of, you know, user that, of, that offers a simplified user experience to let user to farm and to auto compounding their yields uh, from different protocols. Mm -hmm. So that's how, you know, we build our first product flex savings. Uh, you know, user can just, you know, do like one click stake uh, kind of deposit into our vault and our vault can, you know, using a smart contract uh, to allocate users fund into uh, DeFi protocol and earn some yield for the users. Uh, all the yield is auto compounding, meaning that the user won't worry about, uh, don't need to worry about it at all. Um, uh, and uh, when they, when they withdraw, Basically, they withdraw all their principal plus the auto compounded yield. Mm -hmm. uh, so it saves a lot of gas fees for the users, um, and also like uh, and also we offer higher return because of the auto compounding. So, what sort of returns um, um, could could anybody get using the flex savings option on Bella? Uh, it varies because like the their their return comes of comes from two components. The first of all is the intrinsic uh, trading fees uh, and also intrinsic uh, intrinsic uh, reward from our partner Curve.Fi. So it's a stable stable coin swap um, that offers uh, that is actually the largest stable coin swap, um, and they have they charge uh, they charge a transaction fee, uh, they charge a trading fee every time when there are traders who swap between say like USDC to USDT. So that goes to liquidity providers uh, and goes to our users basically. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one part of the yield. The second part of the yield is our own subsidy, right? So we subsidize user with our own token BEL mm -hmm. and that kind of combined uh, APY right now is about you know, high single digit for, for stable coins. And it has been, we've been running, uh, the protocol has been uh, safely running for the past uh, a year, um, yeah, uh, around a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So in order to generate that yield for somebody who's in say flex savings, does it require you to burn um, your, your belt, a Bella token in order to generate that 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 yield for the 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 staker. Uh, yes. Uh, so not burning bell, but more like distributing more bell to our uh, to our depositor. Okay. Right. So yeah. So like for each vote, you know, we'll calculate uh, how much how many bell tokens that we're going to subsidize on a monthly basis, uh, on top of the yield that user on top of the intrinsic yield that people can get from Curve. Finance. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you can think about Curve as our base layer. We are kind of the one layer on top of Curve Finance, and we have our own token. So that's why we are able to subsidize user with our own token as well. Um, yeah. So, um, so how are you collateralizing the the issuance of more tokens? Mm, sure. Yes. So uh, for so for uh, amount of intrinsic yield portion of that yield is going to the treasury. And then, uh, and then we, uh, so like sometimes we use the treasury to buy back bell, buy back bell token. Uh, it's actually written in the smart contract that certain amount of the intrinsic yield will actually go, you know, to, to, to bell. So that's how, you know, like, I think in the long run, we can reduce the subsidy of bell tokens uh, and, you know, as more and more users are using Bella Flex Savings, uh, you know, it, the, there's more intrinsic yield that goes to Bell token, that goes to reduction of Bell token circulation. Um, I think that's going, 
that's yeah that's slowly uh that's kind of a, a slow process um yeah but our product itself is pretty solid and it's been running for the past a year and a half mm -hmm. uh we, we have uh, around yeah i think in total we have around a thousand uh users and mm -hmm. uh and they the, the total deposit uh is about 20 million dollars so far mm -hmm. uh, the tvl has been down because you know the market has been down but on, at peak, we had nearly like a, a 100 million TVL before. Mm -hmm. In terms of, I mean, how do you manage? Because um, I think there was a recent spike in trading volume. Oh, I think it was in May or the end of May, just a few days ago. I mean, how did that? How did your technology stack up and 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 deal with that sudden spike in in volume? I think it was half a billion. Um, of trading volume, how did your the protocols um, behave at that time? Uh, which trading volume are you talking about? Is it Bell? Bell. Yeah, Bell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, like, I per personally, like, I don't know why, like the 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 volume spiked. Uh, we've been you know, Bell token has been floating on the secondary market for. Uh, since like uh, September 2020, mm -hmm. uh, and we, uh, you know, uh, we we don't we don't kind of uh, kind of try to impact the market at all. So mm -hmm. when my friends came, you know, came last week, uh, two weeks ago, uh, asking me what was going on with Spell Token, I was like, I have no idea. I have to search Twitter <laughs> to see what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, like we uh, we rolled out our latest product, uh, which is the uh, Uniswap V3 simulator called Bella mm -hmm. Tuner, uh, in January this year. So it's also been a while that we launched our new product. Uh, I think maybe people finally realized that uh, we build solid products, <laughs> um, and yeah. that kind of contributes to the trading volume. <clears throat> to the trading volume. Yes. No, but it's very good that the, that your technology and the and the way that this the, the you've structured Bell was able to withstand quite a significant spike in that trading volume, because that has a, that can challenge some some um, protocols, particularly if they like stable coins. But can you explain a little bit more about you, first of all, you know, we talk about Uniswap. If you can explain what Uniswap is, and sure. then you talk a bit about your Turner Simulator in terms of how useful it is for people who are doing quantitative um, quantitative analysis on trading strategies, et cetera, and the associated costs. Sure. Uh, yes, Uniswap uh, is the largest DEX, so decentralized exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, use Uniswap to trade um, different uh, tokens. Uh, and Uniswap supports multiple blockchains like Uniswap, uh, like, like Ethereum, Polygon, and some other uh, like Arbitrum, uh, optimism, optimistic uh, rollups. So uh, Uniswap smart contract is very complex uh, because Uniswap v3 upgrade, uh, it actually allow users to define the liquidity range that they want to provide liquidity. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you one example. Uh, for Uniswap v2, right, so the, the old version, uh, you have to supply liquidity along the whole curve that Uniswap has, right? The X, Y, K curve uh, yeah. that Uniswap has. However, for Uniswap v3, you can actually define, you know, I want to only provide liquidity for Ethereum between $800 to say like $1,500. Mm -hmm. So it's much higher capital efficiency because you're only providing liquidity, you know, with a range, within a range. Mm -hmm. Um, so that gives more opportunity for quant LPs, so quant liquidity providers, to um, a time uh, to like to change their liquidity provision range, you know, uh, along using some statistical model or some other you know, models, mm -hmm. and to gain the max capital efficiency uh, that that they can get. So it offers basically, if you are like a quantitative uh, liquidity provider, you can. High, higher chance you can get a higher return because you increase your capital efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. So like as a quant uh, LP, you know, in the old days, you need to fork uh, the mainnet, fork the Ethereum mainnet, and then you need to backtest using Uniswap v3 uh, real data. And that takes a long time. So 
uh, on average, it takes at least you know uh, several hours to a couple of days to back test your strategy against real data from Uniswap V3. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so we we you know we uh, a lot of the users in our community because I'm very I'm very active in the DeFi community and a lot of the people who actually need a tool that they can back test their strategy within you know a couple of seconds mm -hmm. instead of a couple of days. Right, so that's how you know last year in the second half of 2021 we decided to build a new product uh, called tuner simulator to help these quantitative lps uh, and even product projects that build on top of uniswap v3 like aggregators uh you know like smart pools that build on top of uniswap v3 to utilize our product to do better back testing and to also detect the the vulnerability of flash loan uh, of any tokens. So we um, uh, we launched uh, we officially launched this uh, tuner simulator back in November last year, and we've been upgrading it. Uh, the latest release was actually uh, recent, very recent, uh, and now we have uh, about a hundred stars on GitHub, and we have about thirty forks uh, on Git on GitHub. Right, so this product is completely free to use. It's an open library, open source, uh, and we see a lot of people are using it. You know, we even get contributors, of, you know, like the, uh, contributor developers who are improving, you know, our open library. Okay. But so, where's the business model? Where's the business model for you? Of course, it's an open source protocol and it's being developed all the time. But yeah. of course, how are you applying that to your business model within within Bella? Yeah, there's no business model. Uh, it, it carries our name. Uh, you know, it's a Bella Tuner Simulator, but uh, it's an open library. It's a tool that for a lot of, you know, benefits a lot of users. Uh, however, there is no business model. We don't make money off the, this tool. Sure you don't, but there must be, you know, you, what you're doing is you're building community around it. Yes, we are building your customers yeah. in the future. Yeah, we are building community and uh, we actually, uh, I mean, we actually have a, have a plan, but it's not like, it's, it's not a you know it's not a set in stone plan mm -hmm. to build uh, smart pools on top of Uniswap v3. You know uh, we can you know we can better utilize dog fooding our own uh, you know our own product. Mm -hmm. uh, so once we so if we are going to build the smart pools, uh, I guess you know more people will come and deposit because we have these tools. Uh, you know we can offer better data analytics. Um, however. Uh, this plan is not set in stone and we don't have a timeline for this. Uh, it's just something that we can think in the future. Yeah, you're just monetizing all your knowledge and all your hard work and the work of the community for the benefit of the community. <laughs> yes, yes. That's very, very interesting. Um, if I had to um, ask you, as it's been, you know, you've been talking about some amazing things here. And it's amazing technologies and evolutions. And you and your team have built some amazing DeFi products. Um, you know, if you look at the Bella Protocol platform, you can, and I, I keep asking you what you can earn and things, et cetera, et cetera. But is it right to say that the, the sort of interest rates that most people could generate using? the flex saving protocol okay is around what four or five percent something like that yeah something like that yes yeah. but that's very that's and then of course you know there's the another four percent goes to the stakers as well doesn't it um i think right now like uh, it's flow uh it's very it varies because of the bell token price and also mm -hmm. because our infrastructure which is per finance to so the crv token price now, there are a lot of moving factors, but I would say, you know, single digit is a, you know, it's a, it's a ballpark. Yeah, exactly. It's particularly now in the, the challenging world that we have. Yes. <laughs> yes. But if I had to ask you a question, where do you see um, the DeFi space evolving to and its, uh, its mass adoption? How far away do you think that is? If you had a forecast ahead? 
I would say like the mass adoption for Web3. So not only DeFi, but also other like NFTs or uh, mm -hmm. games uh, and other applications. I think the mass adoption should come uh, in the next five years or so. It's mm -hmm. not going to come within the next two years because there are so many things that we need to work on on the user experience side, on the infrastructure side. Um, you know, mm -hmm. like we can, with better infrastructure, we can enable better applications, right? So, um, um, so right now, I just don't see, um, I just don't see much, um, you know, like with, uh, you know, like DeFi, DeFi is already very complex, right? So the more complex it is, the more risk it has uh, to be hacked, you know, to be manipulated and uh, DeFi should be, so actually like I, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of, um, Ave and also Compound because they are they're risk averse, right? They are they know that they are building like a financial uh, infrastructure, and they are very careful on what kind of asset they list on as the collateral. So um, yeah, so like for for DeFi, I guess you know it's going to be more and more conservative. Um, the less is more, <laughs> uh, and uh, we just need to wait for user mass adoption uh, to come. That just requires more, you know, more, more uh, what I call simple protocols, and then creates that level of trust. And people don't need to know about all the the technology behind. They just have to trust that it that it does what it says on the box. Uh, yes and no. Uh, for for ordinary users, you know, they don't understand the technology. I don't think there's a. I don't think it's a must for everyone to understand the technology. Uh, however. Uh, the one thing that these DeFi protocols bring on the table is that if you want, if you really want to dig deep into the tech, you can, right? So it's, you know, it, it offers the op opportunity, right? It offers the access for people who really want to understand, right? Uh, in traditional finance, it's all black box. You can't even see what's going on inside, even if you want to dig deep. Mm -hmm. That's a major difference. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for that. So uh, we've come close to the end of our hour, and I really, really appreciate um, your time. And Felix, you have really, really um, um, enlightened our audience. As I've very much enjoyed speaking to you. If anybody wants to know more about you, your company, et cetera, can you just give everybody your website and also your social media handles so that they can DM you directly if they don't want to get in touch. Sure. Uh, yes, the website for uh, Bella is B E L L A dot Phi, Bella dot Phi. Uh, and for ARPA is ARPA Chin, A R P A Chin dot uh, IO. Uh, these are the websites. My own, uh, my personal Twitter account is uh, Felix MXU, uh, and uh, DM is open. Always happy to chat about new ideas uh, and new products. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's really been an honor to talk to you, Hilton. Thank you very much indeed, Felix, for your time. And we will put all those, um, those um, links at the, you know, at the bottom of the interview. Felix, you thank you very much for your time. And on behalf of Open Business Council, Cities ABC and Fashion ABC, um, we really, really thank you um, for sharing some great insights with us today. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>